Uh, thanks so much for coming, and welcome to the second season of lectures by the curatorial staff here at the Honolulu Museum of Art. Um, it's, um, it's an honor to be the first person to present at this new series. Um, for those of you who um, haven't met me yet, my name is Stephen Salel, and I'm the Robert F. Lange Foundation Research Associate for Japanese Art here at the museum. Um, normally, under these circumstances, I would say that I will do my best to set the tone for the future lectures in this, uh, this season's series of talks. Uh, however, considering the topic of my lecture today, uh, and for that matter, the um, topic of much of my research here at the museum, I can honest, honestly say that I hope that, I, that the ideas that I present here do not, in fact, reverberate throughout the season. Um, otherwise, I'm afraid that our institution would develop a little bit of a reputation, if you know what I mean. Um, and it, if you don't know what I mean, then uh, I'll be clear. Uh, I uh, wear many hats here at the museum, but uh, one of the projects on which I focus um, rather um, uh, regularly is on the topic of Japanese erotica. Um, several years ago, the museum came into the possession of the Richard Lane Collection, an amazingly diverse collection of Japanese paintings, uh, prints, and woodblock printed books. And it just so happens that uh, Richard Lane is or was one of the foremost authorities on the subject of shunga, that is, Japanese erotic art. And so, beginning last autumn, and continuing for the next two years, Sean Eichmann, the curator of Japanese art here, and I are co-curating a series of exhibitions about the genre of shunga and what it teaches us about the sexual culture of early modern Japan. In conjunction with the exhibition, uh, the, this uh, first exhibition, uh, which is titled Arts of the Bedchamber, Japanese Shunga, and which focuses on the uh, 17th and early 18th century, uh, Sean and I have given a couple of talks about various aspects of the exhibition. In November, uh, I talked about the surprising ways in which gender was defined in early modern Japan. Uh, we touched on uh, such uh, topics as uh, nanshoku, um, which um, could be described as um, an early uh, form of homosexuality in Edo culture, but which we uh, simultaneously argue uh, could be uh, defined as uh, a, a, a form of heterosexuality if you consider uh, the, the, the younger member of the relationship, who I show here on the right, um, and, and who we refer to as a wakashu, uh, if you were to uh, define that person as a sort of a third gender individual. It's a complicated uh, issue, but if you're uh, interested in it, uh, there's a, a section of the exhibition uh, that discusses um, the, the, these issues. Last month, uh, Sean Eichmann offered a compelling analysis of the Japanese commercial sex industry as it's reflected in both 
erotic uh, or explicit and non-explicit Japanese prints. We've even had a film component to our special programming. Uh, also last month, we screened Taboo, uh, known also in Japanese as Gohato. Uh, the final film of the acclaimed director uh, Oshima Nagisa. So today I'd like to round out our discussion of the exhibition by focusing on the emergence of erotica as a distinct genre during the 17th century. Now, I suppose it's needless to say, um, but my talk will include uh, images and ideas that are sexually graphic in nature. And um, so, as with the exhibition in general, um, this is not intended for a general audience, and if we have anybody here who uh, feels uh, uh, that uh, such a discussion would be um, disturbing or inappropriate to listen to, um, and if you feel this pres presentation just isn't for you, well, please don't worry, I entirely understand. When I talk about the origins of Japanese erotic art, I'm talking specifically about the social factors that led to the popularization of sexually explicit imagery in the early 17th century. Uh, I'm afraid that when people see the title of my talk that they think that I might be talking about which artist it was who depicted a man with an extremely large penis. Uh, that's not the case. I, um, I'm not going to talk about that because actually um, I think that uh, a, a thorough study of the beginnings of Japanese erotic art is rather impossible. Um, because since the Stone Age, quite literally, uh, we human beings um, and Japanese um, people um, included have been fascinated with fertility symbols and other depictions of sexuality. Um, there's uh, the old saying, uh, I don't know if it's accurate or not, but there's the, the saying that prostitution is the oldest profession. And I would argue that uh, if that is so, then image making uh, has an equally long history um, because there needed to be somebody around to paint the prostitute's portrait. In the early 17th century, however, around the time that the style of painting and printmaking that we refer to as ukiyo-e first appeared, we see that sexuality becomes a, a strikingly frequent topic in this artwork. So much so that many people describe erotica as a subgenre of ukiyo-e, while other people might argue that the discussion of sex, in fact, pervades all of ukiyo-e. One question, however, hasn't received sufficient attention, and that is why. Why did artists from this specific time period, and presumably the public uh, that patronized them, develop such an intense interest in sexually explicit imagery, and why was Shunga so closely connected with ukiyo-e? When we search for a definition of ukiyo-e, we often hear that it has origins in Buddhist philosophy. Uh, I have here uh, a quote from the uh, the, the wall text in the Lange Gallery right now, and it, it offers a definition like that, um, saying that ukiyo-e is 
a Buddhist term for impermanence. Were Buddhists interested in erotica? Um, wouldn't they get into trouble for that? Um, unfortunately, there are a lot of misunderstandings about the origin of Japanese printmaking, and uh, I think that this is a perfect opportunity for us to address those uh, complicated aspects of the definition and to see if we can arrive at a definition that's a little bit, a little bit clearer. We're going to need to run around the museum quite a bit, however, in order to find the answers that we're seeking. We'll start by bouncing back and forth between the Shunga exhibition in the um, in Gallery 14, uh, otherwise known as the Temporary Exhibitions Gallery. Uh, we'll bounce back and forth between there and the, the Lange Gallery that shows Japanese woodblock prints. And, and between those two places, we'll be talking about the role of humorous wordplay in Japanese art. Then after that, I'd like to take you over to the Buddhist gallery, where we can talk about the term ukiyo and the, the Buddhist meanings that it does contain. Uh, and from there, I'd like to combine the topics of wordplay and ukiyo. Um, I'd like to show you uh, a book that we don't have on display right now, but that's in storage, uh, and uh, that shows uh, a clear example of that Buddhist definition of ukiyo. And then I'd like to bring you back here to the Japanese art gallery, where we have several woodblock printed books on display that um, offer a kind of antithesis to these Buddhist ideas, these Buddhist concepts of ukiyo that we've been discussing. And finally, I'm going to wrap those ideas up and take us back to Gallery 14, the Shunga exhibition, where these disparate artworks and ideas can coalesce into the development of a culture of sexuality. So if you visit the, the Lange Gallery, uh, you'll see right now we have on display a print rotation that deals with the topic of Girls' Day and more generally describes the social identity of women in early modern Japan. And as a component of that display, we have a vitrine with woodblock printed books. These books are etiquette manuals that were published uh, from uh, the 17th through the 19th century, and that were a very popular form of education, and some might argue uh, social indoctrination uh, for, for Japanese women. The most popular of these texts was called Ona Daigaku, which translates roughly to the greater learning for women. And if this book looks a bit familiar to you, uh, that might be because only a few hundred feet away in the Shunga exhibition, you can find a parody of this book. <laughs> 
the owner died after. With the witty substitution of the final Chinese character, the title now means intense pleasure for women. And when you compare the contents of the book, you'll notice that the parody of Onna Daigaku extends far beyond just this wordplay in the title. But in fact, it is this wordplay that I'd like to focus on um, for today. Um, wordplay was an extremely popular form of humor in 17th century Japan. Here's another work in the Shunga exhibition. It's a woodblock printed book uh, that depicts uh, kabuki actors and discusses their sexual escapades. The image here shows two actors whiling away their time. One of them, the one on the left, is reading an erotic text and his partner, uh, crouching behind him, is interested in something a little bit more cardiovascular than reading, let's put it that way. Uh, the inscription in the corner of the image refers to both of their activities. What we rarely see makes us smile. The reason why the fellow on the left rarely sees erotic books is because even in 17th century Japan, uh, in which the culture of sexuality was uh, blossoming, uh, it was still considered very gauche to look at books like this in public. <laughs> I hate to think what a person from that time period would think if they um, jumped forward in time and visited an art museum and saw all of these books on display in Gallery 14. Um, the quote, though, also refers to uh, the uh, relationship between the two fellows. Uh, the, uh, the young Wakashu uh, rarely sees the uh, romantic advances of his partner because his partner is directly behind him, and he can't rotate his neck that far. Again, a form of witty wordplay. So, uh, with that little discussion about wordplay, let's shift gears here a little bit and begin talking about a very complicated form of wordplay that does have Buddhist origins. Let's head over to the Buddhist gallery and talk about the term ukiyo-e, um, which I would argue is one of the most profound and enduring forms of wordplay in the history of Japanese art. The word ukiyo originates from Indian Buddhist philosophy. It's a Japanese translation of the Sanskrit term samsara, which refers to the torturous cycle of birth, life, death, and rebirth, from which a Buddhist tries to escape through uh, meditation, enlightenment, and um, with, with the hopes of entering nirvana. The Japanese term ukiyo was, and I use the term was um, very intentionally because, the, as I'll describe in a bit, the, the, the word changes quite a bit. But the, the term ukiyo was a compound of two Chinese characters, and the first character, uki, uh, pronounced also as ureeru means troublesome, agonizing, torturous. 
It's a bit hard to grasp the extent to which certain schools of Buddhism in uh, early modern and pre-modern Japan focused on the pain of human existence, especially when the Buddhist artworks that we are familiar with here at our museum, such as this sculpture of the Bodhisattva Guanyin, or in Japanese, Kanon, uh, radiate such an aura of peace and tranquility. But if we were to look beyond the borders of our museum, and if we were to look at, for example, the paintings by Iwasa Matabe, uh, we could see very clearly the nihilistic uh, view of life and death that was quite an important aspect of Buddhism during the 17th century. Iwasa Matabe was nicknamed Ukiyo Matabe. Um, as you can see from this print we have here in our collection, this is actually the right half of a diptych, um, but it explicitly says uh, in the title, um, it, it, it explicitly refers to this painter as Ukiyo Matabe. Uh, many people believe that this nickname for the painter arose because he was one of the founders of the genre of ukiyo-e painting. Personally, though, I beg to differ. I think this is a misunderstanding. Uh, he never produced any woodblock prints, and uh, at least to my eye, the paintings that he produced have little resemblance to ukiyo-e paintings. I think, rather, that the reason for his nickname was because one can find in his artworks uh, depictions of war, bloodshed, and so much needless suffering. These are images taken from his uh, most famous work, the tale of Yamanaka Tokiwa, or the tale of Tokiwa in the mountains. Um, it's, it's actually a story that originates from, uh, originates from classical literature, uh, developed in uh, kabuki theater, but uh, Iwasa Matabe in this hand scroll that transforms it into something utterly grotesque. <laughs> and, and I mean that in a good way. Uh, but it's, it's undeniable uh, that uh, the, the, the tone of this artwork is uh, extremely uh, dark and melancholy and brooding. And uh, I, I would argue uh, these are some of the ideas that, 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 that stem from the, um, the, the philosophy of ukiyo. Uh, closer to home, another artwork, uh, an artwork that's in our collection and that was actually on display here several years ago. Um, and, and that also discusses the Buddhist concept of ukiyo is a work by Suzuki Shozan entitled Two Nuns, or in Japanese, Ninin Bikuni. The story of two nuns is quite simple. Once upon a time, there were two nuns, uh, Buddhist nuns who, who lived in a monastery. Uh, one of the nuns had uh, entered uh, the monastery recently after her husband had died. And uh, the two of them uh, spent much of their time discussing philosophy 
and topics such as their own mortality, uh, the uh, physicality of their bodies, the reason why um, we are attached to these bodies and what that corporality means in terms of um, being a spiritual person. Well, one day, one of the nuns was wandering through the forest, taking a walk, and she didn't come back. Um, she was found dead, uh, abandoned on the, the side of the road. The precise circumstances of her death are uh, irrelevant, but uh, suffice it to say that uh, her friend was horrified to, to find th this woman dead like this. Um, and at this point, the story gets a little bit, uh, it, it, it takes an unusual direction. Because the surviving nun, the surviving nun, doesn't bury her friend, nor does she go and tell the authorities what happened. Instead, the woman leaves the corpse there in the forest, and she goes back and visits the corpse every day for a period of fifty-seven days meditating on what happens uh, and what happens to the body is what's referred to as uh, the kusozu, the nine stages of decomposition. Uh, death, distension of the belly, Rupture of the distended belly, exudation of blood, putrefaction, discoloration and desiccation, consumption by birds and animals, skeletal remains, and disjointing and deterioration of the bones themselves. Now, this book was not the product of a particularly eccentric author, uh, nor was the story particularly surprising to the average reader. It may be difficult to believe, but actually the theme of, the, of, of these images, uh, the, the kusolzu, uh, was discussed in Buddhist texts as far back as the 9th century, and it was depicted in Japanese paintings since as early as the 14th century. So let's now change the tone of our conversation here and forget about the dead bodies, and um, let's head up to the Japan Gallery uh, where we can talk about the reception of this uh, text, The Two Nuns, and it, how it fits into our discussion about uh, ukiyo-e and erotica. Up until the 17th century, I believe, the, the domestic warfare in Japan was so intense that the idea of psychologically preparing oneself for death wasn't morbid, it was actually really quite practical. But beginning around 1600, when the shogunate um, was established in the capital of Edo, Japan entered a period of extended peace that lasted over 300 years. And certainly during that time, People struggled with other disasters, famine, disease, earthquakes, but war uh, 
civil war was not an imminent threat to people's lives. The, the view of life as continual pain lost its uh, rationale among commoners. Uh, and so at this time we see a drastic change in Japanese literature as woodblock printed books were becoming more popular and more widely distributed, we saw that the, uh, the, the, the contents, the topics of those books were changing as well. Uh, focusing not so much on spiritual guidance for daily suffering, but more focusing on entertainment. Uh, through which people could forget their hardships or simply focusing on entertainment because people were having an enjoyable life but wanted a bit more. One of the most popular authors at this time was Asai Ryori and we have on display the Japan Gallery uh, several books entitled The Sparrow of Kyoto, a guidebook to the city of Kyoto, written by him. When we look at the images in this book, for example, here we're looking at uh, a scene in Teramachi <laughs> Street. On the right we see uh, a bookseller, and on the left we see a fellow who's selling tea wares. It's hard not to recognize the sense of social stability and the sense of comfort that uh, these people seem to have in their lives. Much different than the images that we saw in the Iwasamata Bay scroll I was showing you a second ago. Um, for these people, meditations on the harsh realities of existence doesn't seem quite so necessary. On the contrary, I'd say, um, for these people on the right, a craftsman producing paper umbrellas, and on the left, a manufacturer of portable shrines, for these fellows, Daily life was taken up by their daily jobs, and in their free time, rather than focusing on philosophy, I think they simply wanted to enjoy themselves. They were, in other words, living for the moment. They would spend their times pursuing pleasure. For example, they might visit the Hikawa Daimyojin Shrine, depicted here, and, and you'll notice down in the lower left corner uh, a wrestling match going on. They might visit the shrine to enjoy watching the wrestling match. Or they might take a ferry down the Kanda River to Monju in Temple, where they could uh, throw a blanket down on the, uh, on the ground and uh, have a picnic with their friends, as we see in the upper right. Or, not surprisingly, they might uh, enjoy their free time by visiting the Yoshiwara brothel district outside of Edo City. And they might spend the evening perusing the district, enjoying the festive atmosphere, and if they felt courageous enough, they might approach one of the courtesans and, and chat with her a bit and, and, and flirt. Um, the fellow might decide to employ the courtesan and uh, spend the evening with her, with some 
innocent, light-hearted entertainment, such as this fellow who has draped a checkered coat over his lap and is playing an improvised game of five in a row or checkers uh, with the courtesan. It wasn't always about sex in the Yoshiwa. But on the other hand, if he was in the mood, uh, they might engage in some activity that was a little bit different than checkers and that didn't require so many game pieces. <laughs> um, could we blame them for not wanting to focus their attention on their own mortality if they had the luxury of ignoring it? In addition to these guidebooks that I showed you a second ago, Asai Ryoi also published novels, and his most famous one, released in 1666, was called Tales of Ukiyo, or in Japanese, Ukiyo Monogatari. The word Ukiyo, as it appears in this title, however, is a pun. The standard character Uki, which I mentioned earlier, means suffering. But here, the character has been replaced with a nonsensical homonym, which literally means floating, drifting, bobbing up and down like a rubber duck. Not exactly the sort of image that provokes feelings of intense angst and existential despair in people. Ryoi offers the following reasoning for the substitution. He says, living only for the moment, turning our full attention to the pleasures of the moon, the snow, the cherry blossoms and the maple leaves, singing songs, drinking wine, and diverting ourselves just in floating, floating, caring not a whit for the pauperism staring us in the face, refusing to be disheartened, like a gourd floating along with the river current. This is what we call ukiyo. And by the way, uh, at this point, I should give credit where credit is due. I didn't translate this text. It was translated by the owner of much of the artwork that we have here, Richard Lane himself. Throughout the text, Ryoi elaborates on this pun of ukiyo as the floating world. The main character in this story, a wealthy young man in Kyoto, is named Kyotaro, a variation on the name Ryotaro, uh, but which literally means Mr. Gord. Again, more wordplay. As a quintessential embodiment of this carpe diem idea, the diametric opposite of the momento mori attitude that the original term ukiyo encouraged. Kyotaro frequents the Shimabara district. Um, if that's not familiar, um, it's the brothel district in Kyoto. In the Shunga exhibition, we spent quite a bit of time talking about the Yoshiwara district and that was the licensed brothel district outside of Edo City. But there were actually also licensed brothel districts outside of Kyoto and Osaka. And the Shimabara is the one outside of Kyoto. At one point in the story, uh, Kyotaro's 
rather conservative relatives caution him about such behavior. Uh, however, as uh, the author Ryoi quotes them, their earnest warnings about the brothel district actually sound more like words of encouragement. And so now I would like to take a moment to read the passage to you. And in order to accentuate the eroticism that underlies Ryoi's text, and to emphasize the ironic tone that this warning given by uh, Ryori's uh, relatives, um, to, to emphasize the ironic tone of that warning, I'm going to illustrate the passage with a couple of images from the Shunga Show. Pardon me if this ends up sounding a little bit like an erotic bedtime story. So here we go. Of late, we hear that you've been frequenting the Shimabara. This is really not a proper thing to do. By her nature, a courtesan is a woman who attends herself well, and therefore shows an appearance full of allure. By the way, the exhibition allure opens very soon. Uh, please uh, be sure to check that out. Strong connections with what we're talking about here today. Her charming willowy tresses, her face lovely as a cherry blossom, her eyebrows with mascara recalling the deep green tea tops of the distant mountains, her laughing crimson lips like the first opening of the hibiscus petals, her arms and legs slim, not at all differing in beauty from the Chinese dianthus just commencing to bloom. Her hips languorous like a loose wound spool, the fragrance of her perfume reaching to the skies. And how lovely when she moves swayingly, truly could she be easily mistaken for the living incarnation of the Amida Buddha. And I pair that last part of the quote with this image because you may notice that the man on the left is um, making a specifically Buddhist gesture to, to, the, uh, to the courtesan. Uh, I've actually seen uh, people, Japanese people, entering uh, the, the Shunga exhibition looking at this image and, and, and pointing and saying, oh, he's Buddhist. <laughs> um, this hand scroll by the school of Sugimura Jihei uh, was painted about 30 years after uh, the publication of Tales of the Floating World. And I think that this connection, again, for that reason, seems rather fitting. Compared to some of the texts we have on exhibit in, uh, in Gallery 14, I admit that this quote is relatively tame, uh, but although Riori's way of talking about sexuality is slightly indirect and codified, I think that you, you would agree with me that it's essentially the literary equivalent of a slightly provocative image in Shunga. If you were wondering what the philosophical relationship between ukiyo-e and erotica is, this is more or less the answer. As I mentioned, Tales of the Floating World was first published in 1666. The first use of the term ukiyo-e, that is, pictures of the floating world, appears 16 years later in the preface of a woodblock printed illustrated book uh, designed by Hishikawa Morunobu in 1682 and entitled Further Pictures of the Floating World. 
in Japanese, ukiyo tsukushi is kushi. We don't have that particular uh, portfolio in our collection, but it probably looked quite similar to this cover sheet of a portfolio of erotic prints uh, that Moronobu produced around the same time period. By 1770, the term floating world became so closely associated with eroticism that Suzuki Harunobu published uh, this portfolio, um, and which, which has a narrative to it and which describes a fellow by the name of Ukiyonosuke, literally follower of the floating world who is transformed through magic into a diminutive uh, peeping Tom Thumb and who's forced to wander throughout life uh, watching people fornicate and learning about human nature from those voyeuristic experiences. Here you may see Ukiyo Nosuke he is under this table here, peeping out and watching a calligraphy teacher seducing his teacher. And he's becoming very upset and he's yelling at the teacher saying, how dare you do this? Uh, it, it's actually interesting um, that, of course, it, it's a, a sexually explicit artwork but keep in mind that the artist here is also dealing with the uh, darker uh, sides of sexuality as well and um, has a, a bit of a critical stance about uh, sexuality and not only a celeb uh, celebrating um, attitude. So, now that the first exhibition in this uh, series of exhibitions on Shunga is quickly coming to a close, I was wondering, what has this exhibition taught us? And how can we incorporate these insights into our general understanding about Japanese woodblock prints? In the coming weeks, uh, we will be making some adjustments to the introductory text in the Lange Gallery. In addition to updating the name of the museum from the Honolulu Academy of Arts to the Honolulu Museum of Art, I've added a short paragraph that summarizes the ideas that I've presented to you today in this lecture. My apologies, but since uh, this text appears in the Lange Gallery. Uh, I don't think it would be appropriate for me to illustrate it with lots of explicit images. Uh, but uh, basically, the text reads in part, uh, the imagery of ukiyo-e, courtesans, actors, and landscapes, highlights a profound cultural shift that defines the Edo period. And then I explain the relationship between two competing paradigms. Originally, ukiyo was defined as a world of suffering, a nihilistic worldview promoted by Buddhist <coughs> authors. But in the 17th century, ukiyo was reinterpreted as the floating world, a carefree, pleasure-oriented worldview. And this worldview was promoted over the following three centuries by a legion of artists and authors whose woodblock prints and woodblock printed books we proudly display on a daily basis here at the Honolulu Museum of Art. That is my talk for today. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, I also wanted to uh, thank uh, Scott Kubo, who is helping out with uh, videotaping this talk, and we are going to try to put these talks 
up on the website in case um, people want to see them at a later date. Um, and um, I wanted to also give a, a brief reminder that next week, uh, Sean Eichmann, the curator of Asian art here, will be giving a lecture on Wednesday at 4 o'clock. The title of the lecture is An Introduction to the Buddhist Cave Temples of the Ancient Kazil Kingdom. Uh, thank you again very much for coming. And if anybody has any questions, I would be happy to answer them as best I can. about how to be a good housewife and um, it's an idea that um, when, whenever I look at the uh, etiquette manuals I guess, I, guess I, I tend to think about reruns of Leave it to Beaver yeah. or something like that. Um, it, um, it's a uh, a lifestyle and, and uh, uh, a, a way of uh, behaving that's a lot different than um, what contemporary American women and men uh, are used to, uh, I think. Uh, however, I think that it was quite uh, common at that time and quite accepted I, I think that uh, when a, a woman um, gets married and um, enters into her husband's household, and, and it would, she would literally um, enter his household, and, and her, um, e each family has a family registry that you know, can trace, they can trace back um, their registry and, and, and trace back their lineage. When, when a woman gets married, her name would be crossed off of uh, her parents' family registry and added onto her husband's family registry. Uh, but that uh, idea of uh, uh, joining her husband's family, I believe that many women thought of that as a form of security. Um, they could uh, rest assured that they would um, be taken care of and, and live comfortably, which during the 17th century was a, uh, not guaranteed by any means. Uh, in the Shunga exhibition, we discuss the question of um, why would parents sell their young daughters uh, into the Yoshiwara to be assistants for courtesans and, and, and later to become courtesans of themselves? Why would these parents essentially sell their children into prostitution? And we talked about some of the incredible hardships that these families had to deal with, the incredible dangers of, of famine and, and disease and uh, lack of, of proper 
uh, nutrition. Um, ironically, um, life was much more comfortable in uh, a, legal, a legalized brothel district than it was in the countryside where a swarm of locusts or something could wipe out, wipe out your crops and basically leave you starving. Um, so I, I think that it's hard for me to really say uh, what sort of lifestyle or what sort of attitudes um, would, um, would, would, would be um, acceptable and, and, and expected of, of women during that time period. But to answer your question directly, uh, I haven't heard about any uh, developments in uh, feminism um, or any women who were uh, actively uh, pursuing their uh, social rights until the uh, late 19th and early 20th century. And at that time, actually, there's really quite a, uh, a, a quick development in uh, women's rights. Uh, or th there, there was a lot of struggle uh, uh, for women's rights. It, um, women didn't uh, attain a lot of those rights until shortly after World War II. Uh, but it's, it's interesting to note that if you were to compare the Japanese constitution as it exists right now, and which was, uh, which was uh, promulgated in 1945, um, and if you compare that to the American constitution, women in Japan actually are insured of um, more civil rights than American women. Um, But, of course, there's a bit of discrepancy between what's written in a document and the way people live their lives, or choose to live their lives. Yes? I just wanted to ask you, following up on what you just said, um, what if uh, a woman, after she is in the issue artist, she wanted to get married? Is it possible, or is she a woman forever? Right, right. Um, well, um, I'll give this, uh, I'll, I'll give an, an answer, I'll, I'll give my best uh, stab at that answer, but um, I may need to refer to, uh, to Sean, who, who uh, has done quite a lot of research about the Yoshiwara. When a woman entered uh, into the Yoshiwara at whatever age, be it as uh, um, an adolescent, apprentice to a courtesan or at an older age um, as, as a courtesan herself. Um, usually they entered at a, at a young age, but uh, they were essentially sold by their families in, into uh, the, the brothel district and they weren't allowed to leave. There were a few exceptions. Uh, if a woman became a gravely ill and needed to go to a hospital, uh, she could be uh, carried out of the Yoshiwara on a gurney. Uh, and if a, a woman uh, developed a relationship with a client who was wealthy enough and uh, devoted enough to her to purchase her bond from uh, the proprietor of her brothel, then she could leave in that way. And there are stories of, uh, of women who did leave the uh, Yoshiwara in that way. Uh, and those stories were certainly repeated quite a bit because it was quite a romantic uh, ideal. But I don't think it happened very often. Later in the 20th century, I've recently learned uh, there were 
some, uh, e the, the Yoshiwara continued um, until the 1950s. Uh, it, it's kind of surprising to people, um, but it, it's something that we'll talk about in the second and third Shunga exhibitions. Um, in, in the 20th century, women in the Yoshiwara, um, well, the, the, there are one or two examples of courtesans who actually married uh, politicians and um, became the wives of very prominent politicians. But again, I think these are stories that are uh, focused on um, for their sensationalist aspects and their, their romantic aspects and they really don't um, they, they're not the norm by any means. So what did the majority of the women do if they didn't have clients who, who took care of them and bought, bought them out essentially? In, um, in their late twenties or thereabouts uh, they would uh, retire whether voluntarily or involuntarily they would retire some of those retired courtesans would go on to become matrons in their brothel or another brothel. The matrons were called yarite, and, and they basically managed the affairs of the younger courtesans. Um, in literature, they, these uh, matrons were usually depicted as cynical uh, characters, um, cruel characters, um, sort of along the lines of an Oliver Twist villain or something. Uh, but uh, we can imagine that if they did have uh, uh, anger towards the courtesans, it was probably out of envy more than anything else. Uh, and the other courtesans, what happened to them? Uh, we can only imagine, uh, but probably a lot of them uh, went out into um, the, the world, so to speak, and uh, resorted to unlicensed prostitution, which was uh, actually, although they were free um, to move wherever they wanted, uh, it was actually a, a very unpleasant lifestyle compared to that of a Yoshiwara courtesan. Uh, the, uh, the, their conditions were quite a bit more desperate. We do, in the Shunga exhibition, talk a little bit about uh, bathhouse girls and um, uh, street prostitutes who were referred to as nighthawks. And we, we have some depictions of um, those women in uh, illustrated books from the 17th century. All right. All right, well, thank you again so much for coming. And uh, thank you for all of your enthusiasm about the exhibition and these events that we have tied to it. We uh, promise that we will uh, continue uh, doing this as um, we uh, start the second of our series of uh, Shunga exhibitions in November. And if, again, if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to let me know later. Um, this will be ending in March uh, 16th. Um, in, in just uh, uh, a couple of weeks. So, anyways, thank you all again for all of your enthusiasm.